Welcome to Focus on Art. I'm Barbara cohen -Ear. Those of us that live in northeastern Oklahoma love Tulsa. It's a beautiful and gracious city. It has a wonderful cultural background. Uh, it's like a rich tapestry that's been made up by diverse people with diverse interests and heritage. Into that tapestry are sewn two world-class museums, a number of smaller museums that have very specific focus and grand examples of 20th century architecture. This segment of Focus on Art is one in a special series titled Tulsa Treasures. Stay tuned. This morning we're at Gilcrease Museum. We're going to be visiting first with Kevin Smith. Kevin is the educational curator here at Gilcrease, and we're going to see a wonderful exhibit of Latino art and its relationship to the American West. Good morning. How are you doing? Good morning. Doing fine. Just playing the Tarahumara Rasp here. Well, I didn't know you got to touch things at a museum. Well, uh, most often you don't, and in this museum right now, only in this gallery can you touch some things, but uh, we have installed some interactives. Um, this is a prototype gallery where we're trying out some new things and, and being able to touch some things and uh, getting them out from behind the glass, so to speak, is, is something we feel is going to be very beneficial. Great. Well, this is, I know that the children, and I have to admit probably us adults too, are going to really like to be able to actually get our hands on this. Oh, you bet. This, this rasp here has been up for a while. and. Um, uh, we've done some formal observations, but informally I can tell you as we pass through the gallery sometimes we see more adults playing this <laughs> than children, so, so you're right about that. Yeah. Okay, well Kevin, now why don't you tell us a little bit about this exhibit as you have it up today and then how this is going to evolve. Okay, well as it is today, um, again it is a prototype situation which means that we're trying out some new educational devices and we mean by that both formal and informal. Okay. Um, whether you have a guided tour or you just walk into the museum, we wanted to try some new things um, such as what you see here with the RASPs to hopefully engage people a little bit more uh, completely when it comes to considering Gilcrease's Latino collection. For instance with the RASP here we have nearby some pieces from the collection itself, whereas the RASP is an education artifact and not okay. officially accessioned in the museum collection. These pieces are. And you can see that what we're doing here by showing some flutes, by showing the Nidrit, um ceremony here, which involves music, and then by the castanets, we're trying to make the connection from the contemporary to the, to the ancient past and get people thinking about traditions here in the Americas that um, go way back but are still with us today. Okay, what do we have uh, date-wise in this case? How old are these things? Um, the castanets are, are the more contemporary pieces and usually you don't see this sort of a, a, um, a juxtaposition but again because of what we're trying to get across here are some new new ideas. We've put these with, with uh, for this is, these are probably 19th century but they could easily be 20th century castanets with some pieces that date from A.D. 700 to 1500. So, um, the, again, the point is um, cultural persistence. All right. Well, it's a wonderful approach. Mm -hmm. Now, are these pieces from the original collection that Mr. Gilcrease put together? Um, we have quite a bit that uh, Thomas Gilcrease collected himself, but we also have um, quite a bit of materials from Mexico, Central America, et cetera, that are from donors. Okay, so this collection continues to grow. It's not a, not a static no, thing. No, no. Oh, I think that's wonderful. And we hope to continue to add to it with more contemporary pieces as well. Okay. Yeah. What do you think we should look at next? Well, let's just uh, move right along the wall here. Um, and I'll just point out, since we're talking about the interactives, you can see that we have these um, um, two labels here that explain that you can touch things in this gallery. Now, as you're leaving the gallery, there's a, a sign that says, do not touch. But you'll notice we have two of these. 
Um, one is in English and one is in Spanish. And this is very important to us too, this is something new. Not only um, is it bilingual because of what the collection is about, but because there is a strong Latino community here in Tulsa um, uh, that is very much alive. And so um, what we've done is to go to this community and ask for translators and people who can help us. And as we develop uh, further towards the permanent installation, we'll be asking for that community to assist us even more. Well, I think you know, when people think about Gilcrease, we think uh, American Western art, and sometimes we forget the importance of Latino art in the overall fabric of American art, particularly from our part of the country. And it is a major part of the collection here at Gilcrease. That's true. It's a major part of the collection, and it's a major part of, of the history of the West that Gilcrease is, is known for. In fact, if we could go look at the only paintings in the gallery that are not by a Latino artist, we could talk about that point even further. Okay, where should we go next? Right over here. Okay. Okay, these are the paintings I mentioned by um, James Walker, a 19th century artist. And again, you'll notice that we have um, two sets of labeling, not only the text, but um, the object ID labels as well are in both English and Spanish. But we were going to talk about how, how does this relate to the West? How does the, the Latino collection relate to um, what we perceive of, of, as Gilcrease representing most right. often? Well, with the rasp we just looked at, of course, we can trace uh, some of contemporary music. We can find that in, in contemporary pop music even. But when we talk about cowboys um, and the collection here, we need to go back and realize that the first cowboys in the Americas really were Spanish-speaking vaqueros. And so these paintings are of vaqueros, and so that's why they're important to be, uh, for us to have them here in the Latino gallery for now. And that's a wonderful painting. Lots of action. Oh, definitely. Um, uh, Mr. Walker was uh, very good at putting action in with these horses and the, and the vaqueros. In fact, if we'll look at the, the painting, the, the other one that we have here, you'll see that even where we've got some gentlemen standing here just chatting, there's still some action going on. They're, they're very great for, uh, for kids to look at, too. And that's another reason we chose these, because we, we want to get this point across about the first cowboys being um, uh, Spanish-speaking people. Kids like horses, and they like this type of painting. And so then we've put this label low. And this is entitled Hispanic Origins of Cowboy Words. And we see words such as lariat from La Riata. We see um, uh, rodeo. Uh, Mustang is from Mustenio. Uh, many chaps, uh, cinch, stampede, many things that uh, we're used to associating, many words we're used to associating with cowboys and, and life on the range in the okay. West and all that really come from uh, the Spanish. And then in the, the uh, 19th century, um, when the English-speaking uh, settlers moved into the Southwest United States and the Northern Mexico region, many of the Spanish-speaking people um, were forced out. But the vaqueros remain behind to teach uh, ranching techniques, the open range ranching, to um, okay. the English speaking settlers. And so when we look at chaps like this, even some of the gear on the horse, even the sombreros, which sort of um, evolve over time into different, um, again, cowboy hats, we, ha we remember that uh, this is really a part of our Western heritage. Well, wonderful. And it's, you know, it's an aspect, I think, that most people. Uh, either don't realize or they have a tendency to kind of forget about. We're so focused on the John Wayne image of the West, I think, that uh, this brings a little reality. That's exactly right. And, um, you know, that's, we feel like that's really our job here at the museum um, when it comes to our educational objectives. Not so much to be revisionist and go back and change history, but to show as much of the picture as we can so that we don't have a, a limited focus on, on history. Oh, great. I think that's wonderful. Now, you have some other paintings you wanted us to look at over right. here. Right. And um, just like we have the label low behind us here, um, I wanted to show you some different labeling techniques we have over here. Again, basically with kids in mind. OK. And um, what we have are three paintings, the first one um, being called El Volcan. And you know, there's a lot of uh, volcanoes in Mexico. Mm -hmm. and Underneath the object labels, down low again uh, for children, we have the word mountains, which is not the title of the painting, but it's a word that will draw children in and they can read this very simple text. We explain the painting, we talk about 
the Spanish word and that it's, it, it means volcano. Um, and then the next painting, which again deals with horses, is entitled Caballos. But again, we've chosen the word horses. And if I may just read some of this text, horses were first brought to America from Spain. The first American cowboys were called vaqueros. They spoke Spanish. And so what we're doing here also is trying to get children to look at this painting, read this text, and then at the bottom of this text panel, paintings of vaqueros and more horses are on the wall across from this one. Those are the paintings we just looked at. So this is a technique which hopefully will engage um, the viewer in a way that um, normally they wouldn't be so that they would pay more attention to labels and um, be able to interact piece by piece here in the gallery. Okay, I think this is a wonderful idea of tying what's happening over here to what's happening over there. Right. Particularly with children. Exactly. If, if children can um, be asked to move about and, and to sort of have a little, uh, almost a little game in the gallery, even informally like this, then they tend to, we hope, um, pay more attention to the content just by that activity. And again, in, in this painting we have, um, we have a scene of, of children playing. There's some kites flying. And then there's a boy playing a flute here. So we've titled this text panel, Flutes. And we talk about um, the different materials that have been used to make flutes by indigenous people in uh, Mexico and, and the rest of the Americas. And then again, we say, there is a music display in this room. Find the flutes there. Well, that's the first display I showed you by the rasp. Um, some are made of clay. What else in this gallery is made of clay? And hopefully then um, the students or the, whoever the viewer is will, will go to the ceramics and, and um, think about uh, materials that way. Well, Kevin, it seems to me like you've set this up so a teacher could bring a class out and the class could work through the gallery with, a, with a, perhaps a tour guide from Gilcrease or an individual parent could bring a child out and so you can work this both ways. It can be either a group or an individual experience. Exactly, and uh, please remember this is uh, still in the uh, growing process and we're learning and uh, we have had some students out. We've had, in fact, some uh, Spanish classes. We've had from Sepulpa, uh, high school um, dancers actually, and then from Eisenhower here in Tulsa, we had some uh, Latino dances. And so before we had the performances, we had the kids in here, and we were able to watch and see how they responded to the, to the different stops. But this is definitely um, going to develop in such a way that we can have an organized formal tour, or it's also set up, as you say, where somebody can just walk in and hopefully have a learning experience while they enjoy themselves. Right. Well, now we're going to visit with uh, Dan Swan, right. who is uh, also a curator out here, and kind of look at the gallery from a little bit different point of view. But I want to thank you for being right. with us today. Well, thank you. Yes, and I think your new idea for educating the citizens of northeastern Oklahoma is spectacular. Great. Thank you. Dan Swan is the senior curator here at Gilcrease, and he'll be our next guest. Hi, Dan. Welcome to Focus on Art. Well, welcome to Gilcrease, Barbara. Really appreciate being here today, and this is a wonderful concept. I'm so excited about what you're doing. It's one of our major activities at Gilcrease right now is to work in this prototype gallery in anticipation of a major reopening of this and additional spaces um, early in 1995. Well, it's just going to be wonderful. And I love the teaching aspect. I guess that's the old school teacher in me. <laughs> well, it, we're uh, very much going to be focusing on educational activities, interactives, participatory learning in this gallery for children and families. So we're excited about it, too. I think you ought to be. Let's take a look at what you have in this case. Yeah, here we have some uh, masks, uh, hand-carved uh, folk masks from the state of Guerrero, Mexico. And these are all 20th century masks, and uh, masking okay. is a, a very ancient tradition in Mexico. One of the things that we want to try to accomplish in this gallery is to talk about cultural continuity and tradition. Um, these masks are Diablo masks um, and uh, representations of, of the devil. They have an interesting history in that, uh, for example, um, you can see here that these are very much in the, the keeping with European um, representations of devils and it's a direct relationship in that the ancient masks that the Indian peoples of Mexico used the early Jesuits and other missionaries um, were very resistant to acknowledge the existing religions of these people 
And so oftentimes they were the ones who put the horns on masks that were intended for religious and social purposes in the indigenous cultures of, of Mexico. So this is truly a combination of European reaction to the indigenous cultures of, of the uh, North American continent. Oh, that's a very interesting. And all of these devils do have horns, as we would expect them to have. Absolutely. We have another mask over here I'd like to talk to you about. Well, this is certainly a colorful little guy. He is, isn't he? And you've got him out here where people might accidentally want to put their hands on him. Not accidentally. We're using our symbol here, and it says to touch carefully. Okay. One of the things that we want to do in this gallery is to bring some of the objects out from behind that are installed here, mm -hmm. out from behind the plexiglass. Of course, our permanent collections we have to treat in a very special way to make certain that they're here for future generations of Tulsans. <laughs> But what we're doing is bringing contemporary works of, of Mexican and Latino folk art into the gallery. This is a mask that was made in Mexico. And as you can see, it's very much in keeping with traditional Mexican mask making, combining lots of materials. But we want people to experience the boar bristles of the whiskers and of the boar's teeth um, and the leather that's making the ears. Um, and when this wears out, we'll go f uh, purchase another one from a contemporary Latino artist and reinstall it here. Wonderful. This is just an exciting thing to get to really see what this feels like. And it feels kind of like what you'd think it would. Exactly. This is a tigre mask um, or a jaguar. Jaguar is a very important symbol in Aztec and other Indian cultures of, of Mexico. Okay. Great. Great guy here. <laughs> these are additional masks from the permanent collection of the museum. And as you can see in these, you see a lot of lizards and snakes and sometimes frogs. And again, even though these are 20th century, what we would call carnival masks, and many of these were created probably for sale to tourists, which is, is again an important part of cultural change and, and adaptation. But these are very old symbols that are related through the Aztec religion to water, fertility, prosperity. And oftentimes, these masks were probably used in association originally with harvest ceremonies to celebrate the end of a season. So you can see that these symbols today, even though th these masks were created for very different purposes, um, a lot of the symbols and the styles and the materials are, are the same as they were centuries ago in Mexico. OK, now these are carved out of wood. They are. And painted. You know, one thing I was, I was thinking about as we were looking at these, Dan, is particularly in the treatment of the beard and the hair, how much these look like things maybe from ancient Mesopotamia. Well, there's a good reason for that, Barbara. One of the styles of masks that um, developed because of the contact between Europeans and, and indigenous peoples of Mexico, after the conquest of Mexico, a form of mask came about called uh, Christians and Moors. And these are very much representations of Europeans and actually talking about European historical experiences through mass and dancing and other associated activities in Mexico. I guess nobody is isolated in our world at any one time. Absolutely not. OK, well, these are wonderful. And of course, the color's great. Barbara, I'd like to walk over here and take a look at some of the ceramic materials that we have in the gallery. OK. Dan, before we get to the ceramics, let's just stop here for a minute and talk about these wonderful wood carvings. Yes, these are bultos from throughout Mexico. Uh, wood carvings and hand painted. And they're a very important form of Mexican folk art. They represent in many ways the marriage between Catholicism, uh, Catholic belief, faith and belief, and the indigenous uh, religious systems that existed in Mexico prior to, to the conquest okay. by Spain. Um, in this case, we have a, a truly wonderful bulto of the Virgin of Guadalupe. Um, she appeared to Mexican Indians at several points uh, following the conquest of Mexico. And she, today, she is probably one of the most imp important figures in, in Mexican Catholicism. Her feast day is a, a very important holiday and celebration throughout Mexico. And it's a beautiful figure, a great design. And I like the color, too. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. We have another piece here that also speaks to um, uh, the particular form that Catholicism has taken among many people in, in Mexico. This is uh, the Brotherhood of the Penitentes, which is a fraternal order that's based on the concepts of, of charity and public service and uh, religious devotion. And many times throughout the year, uh, the penitentes perform uh, religious processionals in which they commit acts of penance, uh, carrying the, uh, the cross, uh, of symbolizing the crucifixion, um, self-flagellation, and, and other forms of, of penance. 
Well, now on the wall over there, it was I was instructed to see if I could find flutes in other places. That's right. In this exhibit, so I want to point out to you that we have another flute player here, and once again, that tie between the visual arts and the uh, art of music. Absolutely, we want to try to bring a uh, multi-sensory experience to this gallery when it opens in permanent form, and music is definitely going to be an important part of that. Okay, now to get to the ceramics, you have three wonderful pieces in this case. Mr. Gilcrease built a very impressive collection of ceramic figurines from throughout Mexico, but particularly from western Mexico. And here we have uh, a, a human a male figurine from Colima, and this dates probably around 900 AD. Uh, the use of figurines to present uh, uh, some of the activities and uh, some of the styles of both here jewelry and clothing. You can see the headband and he has teeth that are set in. Oftentimes uh, other materials are combined with clay in these figurines, uh, shell, coral, um, turquoise and, and other items. So they're truly wonderful works of art and testament to the craftsmanship and, and technical ability of the indigenous people of Mexico. And he's a wonderful piece. Uh, one thing I think is very interesting is how very contemporary he is. If he were sitting in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, we'd find him to feel very much at home there, I a would think. Absolutely. Or in a market uh, throughout Mexico, you could find uh, contemporary ceramic figures uh, for sale today. Here we have another example from Colima. And again, it uh, represents a very important activity throughout Mexico, particularly in the Valley of Mexico. And that was ball playing and competitive ball contest and, and games. Um, this is one of the uh, uh, activities that not only existed in Mexico, but also eventually diffused into North America, mm -hmm. into areas such as Spiro Mound and some of the other Mississippian uh, civilizations that developed in North America. Ball courts and ball playing were very important activities there also. Just as they are today. Absolutely. The last figure that we have here is from Jalisco, and again, a human figurine. This one a little bit more stylized, but again, we, we can learn a tremendous amount about tattooing and painting, uh, personal adornment, and then again, back to the activities that these figures represent. Well, now, we have an opportunity in this gallery to actually get our hands on one of these clay figurines. We sure do. Let's do that next. Well, Dan, by the handprints here, I can tell I get to touch this piece, right? Absolutely. Help yourself, Barbara. <laughs> okay. Again, this is a piece of contemporary Mexican folk art created by Mexican artisans and craftsmen today. And we wanted people to be able to feel how cool the clay is and to feel the lines that are incised into the back of, of the jaguar. Well, you know, even as you feel that the face, you can almost tell how the artist made this. And that's a very a natural feeling across here and with the ears. Same thing. It's wonderful to have an opportunity to be able to touch this. You really, I think you get a real kinship with the person that actually made the piece. Right. We want people to interact with the objects. And because of our being a museum, we have to oftentimes rely on totally visual interaction. So here we're trying to bring all of the senses to bear as we try to educate people about the collections of Gilcrease and tell some of the stories of the history of the American West. Okay, now if we look at this piece, it appears to me that this piece is somewhat related. Very much so. We're trying again to draw relationships about the continuity that exists within Mexican Latino culture. Um, here we have a dog effigy again from Kalima. Sometimes it's difficult to tell the dogs from the cats in that some of these jaguars oftentimes take on dog-like features too. But this is an important example of, of uh, the, both the ceramics from Kalima and also some of the ideas and the behaviors and attitudes that went along with the people who made and used these objects originally. All right, wonderful uh, step from one piece to the other. Now in this large case kind of out here in the center of the gallery, we have some things that are a little bit different than what we've been looking at. So why don't we start down here on this end and let you tell us sure. about these objects. Yeah, here what we have are retablos, and, and this is a bulto, bultos being the relief carvings, either the figurines, three-dimensional. In this case, it's almost a retablo in that these are paintings, Mexican folk art paintings that are done on wood and oftentimes take on a, a religious uh, subject matter and, again, speak to the various forms that Catholicism assumed as it was missionized by the Spanish throughout Mexico and as the native peoples wanted to perpetuate ideas 
philosophies and symbols from their traditional religions. Here we have just an exquisite uh, bulto of Christ. Here we have a retablo, and this is San Miguel. This is uh, from New Mexico. Again, we're trying to draw the relationships between Latino art and American culture, and that's certainly right. not bounded by any borders. One of the things that we're going to try to accomplish through this gallery is to discuss the ways that sometimes political, geographic, and cultural borders become mingled and create divisions in that there's very little difference in many ways between the Indian people of the American Southwest and the Indian people of Northern Mexico. The division right. by a national boundary doesn't oftentimes really tell the whole story. All right. Well, I think we have covered almost every aspect of Latino art. We've looked at ceramics, we've looked at masks, we've looked at the wood carvings. So why don't we kind of draw this all together uh, by going to something that we probably think of first when we think about the visual arts, and that is a couple of the paintings. Let's do it. Okay. Barbara Thomas Gilcrease um, built a very impressive collection of 20th century Mexican fine art also. Here we have a series from a portfolio of watercolors by Francisco Gutierrez from the early 20th century. I think these are important paintings uh, for our objective here in, in this gallery for a number of reasons. One, they're just visually very, very pleasing and very, oh, very interesting. The other is that you can start to begin to see, in this case, the influences of, of uh, very colonial Spanish style of, of garment, of decoration and embroidery. But then you can also see, as we move on to some of the other paintings, influences from the traditional cultures as well. Here you have a very formal setting as far as a waltz or something It would make us think of European settings. Whereas here you have garb and a dance very much like the pe peasants, the mestizo peoples of modern Mexico would have participated in both during the colonial period and right on through till today. Well, this is just a wonderful place, I think, to end because it brings everything together we've been talking about, the combination of cultures, uh, the collection of of Mr. Gilcrease, and I think it uh, kind of wraps up what you're trying to do here in this gallery. We're going to be working to finish final development of this exhibit components, and we're looking very forward to the opening of the permanent installation in early 1995, so we would like to encourage your viewers to come see us then. Great. Well, I know that they're going to have a, a wonderful time when they come out. Uh, the modern technology is going to put learning at their fingertips. The being able to touch and feel and so forth is going to let them use all of their senses. And uh, gosh, I think you're doing a wonderful job, Dan. Well, thank you, Barbara, and I appreciate you coming out to Gilcrease Museum. Appreciate your being here today. For those of you at home, we appreciate your being with us, as always, for Focus on Art. We'll look forward to seeing you next week.